Hello, everyone. I'm Donna Holly, the president of the Investment Institute, also known as GII. And on behalf of Andrew Zigathy and myself, we welcome you to the first session of our virtual coffee break series. For those of you who don't know us, TII provides non-commercial educational forums for the investment community, which consists of endowments, foundations, pensions, family offices, consultants, and asset management firms. We so look forward to the day that we can all be together in person again. We really, really miss our TII community. And until then, we wanted to come up with something to offer to all of you. So we plan to provide these virtual educational sessions every other Thursday afternoon for the foreseeable future. Um, and at the end of today's session, Andrea will provide some additional information about some other upcoming events that we are planning and are really excited about and can't wait to share with you. So please stay on to the end so you can hear about those. We'd like to thank Dennis Gartman, retired editor and publisher of the Gartman Letter and honestly, one of our absolute favorite speakers that we've ever had in our um, previous forum. And we really thank him for helping us to launch this first virtual uh, webinar. It's just such a different experience and we're so happy to have him here to do that with us. And we also really want to thank Celia Dallas, who is the Chief Investment Strategist for Cambridge Associates and one of our beloved TII Editorial Committee members. Um, Dennis is going to speak for about 20 to 25 minutes and then we'll have Celia moderate the Q&A. So please take a moment to find the question feature located somewhere on your Zoom screen. And you are welcome to type in questions throughout the presentation, anything you'd like us to cover, and we will be taking a look at those. And once again, we thank you so much for being here. This, um, we really look forward to engaging with you all this way. And with that, Dennis, take it away. I will take it away. And the check is in the mail to you for that wonderful introduction. We'll send that along in just a few minutes. Uh, my name is Dennis Gartman, and uh, I'm a trader, and I'm the retired now editor of the uh, sometimes uh, daunting, sometimes uh, well-received, and oftentimes castigated the Gartman letter. I, for 35 years, I got up every morning at 1 o'clock and tried to knock out uh, seven, eight, or nine pages on what's going on in the various markets. I've always considered myself to be the liberal arts major of the capital markets, as I like to say. I, I, I know enough about the grain markets to be dangerous, but... Uh, I've always seen that the grain market, the people who trade the grain markets don't know much about what goes on in foreign exchange. And if I can tell somebody in the grain markets more about the grain markets than he or she knows, they won't be trading grain very long. I, if I can tell somebody who's trading foreign exchange something about foreign exchange that they don't know, they won't be trading foreign exchange very long. My job was to tell the grain trader what's happening in foreign exchange, to teach the foreign exchange trader what's happening over in the energy market, to teach the energy market trader what's going on over in the capital markets, so as I said, I was the, the liberal arts major. I took a broad perspective as to what's going on. Since I retired, I trade only for my own account. I am the uh, chairman of one of a university's endowment in the North. They, uh, I would normally tell them what to say, which university it is, but I'll keep it quiet for right now. And I'm also on the board of directors of North Carolina State's endowment. So I do have some uh, endowment uh, responsibilities. What I wanna talk about today is what's going, really what's going on. And, and when I talk, what I, what I say, about the markets is what I'm doing in my own account. So I have my own money at risk all the time. The first thing I wanna talk about is trade. And let's, let's be blunt. Uh, for 25 or 30 years, as the United States ran trade deficits with China that got progressively larger and larger, and many people were decrying those large and, and ever increasing trade deficits to the point that uh, they, the President of the United States, who I probably shall vote for, but I'll do it with my nose held when I do it. My wife, however, is a phenomenal uh, Trumpista and loves the guy. I think that his trade policies have been deleterious at best and, and uh, wrong at worst. We ran trade deficits with China for years and years. And I used to say, as, as people would tell me that you cannot continue to run these egregious trade deficits, I was told for years that it would be detrimental to the US dollar. And yet every year the dollar got stronger on balance. Every year interest rates in the United States went lower on balance as the trade deficit grew wider and wider. The problem that we have now with the COVID vi virus and, and the political circumstances that prevailed between us and China is that for years, as I like to say, we, gave, we bought stuff from China and gave them paper in return, and it was a wonderful symbiotic relationship. We bought stuff and we gave them paper. And that's one of the reasons why interest rates remain low even as the trade deficit grew wider and wider and larger and larger every single year. 
Indeed, the only time the trade deficit narrowed even slightly, it never got back to being a positive, and then won't probably in, the, in my lifetime, which is uh, hopefully uh, another 30 or 40 years, being that I'm 70 years old, maybe I'll make it to 110, we'll never run a trade surplus. But our trade, the only time in the past 30 or 40 years that the trade deficit got smaller was during 2007, 2008, and 2009. And in speeches that I would give, as people were demanding that we try to run some sort of smaller trade deficit, that we try, and in, in essence, to run a trade surplus, and the president would put into effect trade tariffs to try to do that sort of thing, my response was, why would you want to run a trade surplus? The fact that we ran trade deficits for 40 years, the fact that we bought stuff from China and gave them paper in return, as I said, a wonderful symbiotic relationship, why would you want to change that? The problem is, it's now going to change. We're going to buy demonstrably less stuff from China over the course of the next 5, 10, 50, 15 years. If there's one thing that we can draw from the from the virus circumstance that prevails and from the uh, continued growing and worsening uh, political relationship between us and Beijing is that the, the balance of trade with China is going to get uh, better and better for the United States. The trade deficit that the United States runs with China will get smaller and smaller. So the problem shall be, and this is something that nobody wants to talk about, the problem shall be we will buy less stuff and we will give them less paper. This is the first time in probably 25 or 30 years that I've actually become bearish of the bond market, worried that interest rates are going to go higher, and they'll do so because we're going to run a, large, a smaller trade deficit with China. We will sell them, we will buy less stuff, we will, take, we will give them less paper in return, and I think this is a turning point that's going to last for a long period of time. So for the first time in a long period of time, I'm actually bearish of the bond market, and from a technical perspective, I think today's action that you saw in the bond market was, was reminiscent of a top, what I think is an important top in bonds, an important bottom, an important top in the bond market itself, an important bottom in interest rates. Secondly, who in their right mind, to be quite honest, for the next 15 years is, want, is going to want to own 10-year Treasury securities, 15-year Treasury securities, 30-year Treasury securities with interest rates where they are? You may trade them. You may buy them because you think they might go higher for the next week. You may buy them because you think they might go higher for the next month. But clearly, you're not going to buy them because you think they're going to go up and, and maintain for the next uh, 10 or 15 years. Uh, what, what are we trying? We closed the 10-year this afternoon, I think, with a, base, with a yield of 64 or 62 basis points. In the not-too-distant future, and I mean the, not, the truly not-too-distant future, perhaps less than six months, we'll be back above 1%. And I have to always remember that when I got into the business in the early 1970s, uh, the, uh, the prime rate was at what, 15% when I started, when I bought my seat on the Board of Trade in Chicago to trade bond futures in the late, in the early, 19, early 1980s, the long bond had a 14 and a quarter percent coupon and you couldn't even give it away. I mean, it was incredible. So the fact that we've gone from a 14 and a quarter percent coupon to what are we now, one and a quarter percent coupon on the long bond, that's gonna go up to two or 3% over the next several years, at least, maybe higher. But again, it's because we're going to be running smaller trade deficits with China. We'll be buying less stuff. We'll be giving them less paper. And that can only mean one thing, higher interest rates over the course of the next several decades. And I think that's important. Two, let's talk about stock prices. What a bear market it was. What a bull market it has been. And I use the past tense in both instances because I think that this bull market is a, that we run and people consider bull markets to be those that have rallied 20% from the lows. We rallied, what, 37% from the low in the Dow. We rallied, uh, if my numbers are correct, 35%. We, well, 38%, give or take a percent the, from the low in the Dow, 35% in the uh, S&P, 31% in the NASDAQ from, uh, from the lows. After having fallen by almost exactly the same amounts in the bear market that, that, pre that prevailed. What happens is, and I find it amusing, I was listening to somebody talking on TV this afternoon saying the Dow fell 37% and rallied 37% or we're almost back to even. No, you're not. That's what people forget. Down 37 means you have to go up about 64% to, to break even. People forget that when you lose 50%, you need to go up 100% to break even. And I think that that's a, a, a factor that people tend to forget in, in the present circumstance. The fact that we've had a bull market since um, the, the end of the, that March bear run that, that was obviously predicated upon the COVID virus, virus circumstance was to me predicated upon Federal Reserve Bank policies and Treasury policies. Now, I will applaud the Fed for stepping in as they did and doing exactly what the Fed is supposed to do at a, at a period of peril. 
They were the adult in the room again, just as they were the adult in the room in 2008, after the collapse of 2007. They were taken to task by too many people for being the adult in the room, but I think they've done exactly what they're supposed to do. Even though I'm somewhat to the right of Genghis Khan politically uh, and, and a, an avowed monetarist monetarily, I think the Fed did exactly what it was supposed to do, and I think the Treasury has done exactly what it's supposed to do. And the, the point being that this, this shall continue. It has to continue. There is no choice. Uh, we, we need more monetary expansion. We need more monetary policy to be far more expansionary for the next several months. And we need the Treasury to become even more, an even greater, more egregious spender than we've had thus far uh, in, in, in this current environment. So the rally that we've had is taking us back. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna take off my fundamental cap. Everybody knows how bad the, the economy is. Everybody knows that we're down 4.9% in the first quarter. Everybody should know that the second quarter is probably gonna be at least minus 10%. And certainly, and unless we get some real change in the COVID virus, unless there's a, a a massive amount of therapeutic drugs have become available unless there's real progress towards a uh, towards a uh, vaccination by the autumn or, uh, or early winter this rally is probably going to run its course has probably run its course and i think that if you've had the bounce that you've had if you've been lucky enough to to have enjoyed it if you sat tight did nothing didn't panic on the down on the move down if you're an endowment if you're a pension fund if you're an individual I would counsel you to be much more aggressive in using this strength that we've had in the past several weeks to be demonstrably less long. And I mean, demonstrably less long. In my own account, I actually went short yesterday for the first time, marginally, and the operative word here is marginally, but I'm marginally net short. And I, the only reason, and, and I'm gonna add to it if, I, if when and if the position becomes profitable. But I think the fact that we, that uh, the, uh, as I said earlier, that uh, the Dow rallied uh, or fell 37% and bounced back 37%. The S&P fell 35 and rallied back 34. The NASDAQ fell 31% and rallied back 36. Even so, the Dow is still down 18% year to date. The S&P is still down 13% year to date. And the NASDAQ is down 8% year to date. The topic I wanted to talk, talk about or the title of the topic was he or she who loses least is going to be the winner. And that's what we have to understand. In the present environment, that I think is gonna prevail for a long period of time. And as I've always said, all economics is a study of people's propensity to do something. What is your propensity to get in an airplane? What is your propensity to get in an elevator? What is your propensity to go out if you're a business person to expand capital equipment or to, to employ more people? Your propensities to do either of those things are, have been greatly reduced. And until you change, until that changes, and that's not gonna change for a long period of time, I think the propensity for stock prices to head lower again is greatly increased. So I think, that, I think that's important. It's one of the things I wanna get across this afternoon is that he or she who loses least is going to be the great winner. The other thing I wanna talk about, real estate. I think this is abundantly clear that uh, to, to, I, I like to put things in simple terms. What's your propensity again to get in an elevator until the, there's a vaccine of some major consequence? I think that's greatly reduced. So what is, who's the great, who's the real loser in this circumstance? The elevator towns, the Chicago's, the New York's, the Atlanta's. Who's the great winner? The Omaha's, the Raleigh's, the Birmingham, Alabama's. If there's a way to get short of New York, Chicago, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, San Francisco, if there's a way to get long Omaha, Raleigh, Birmingham, I think that's gonna be the great trade. Again, the, the, the large cities are, are when, when we do get to the, to, to, the, to the autumn and there is a chance to have a, a revisit to the virus, and I think that's probably going to happen before we have a vaccine. I hate to sound terribly pessimistic at all, on all fronts, but until that occurs, are you going to get in an airplane and fly to New York? Are you going to get in an airplane to fly to Atlanta? Your, pr your propensity to do so is greatly reduced, and I think that that's going to continue for a long period of time in the future. So again, I'd like to sell New York, I'd like to sell Chicago, I'd like to sell Philadelphia, I'd like to buy Omaha, Birmingham, Raleigh, et al. Let's talk about crude oil. Amazing what has happened in the crude oil market. First of all, everybody knows that the United States had become, because of what happened in the Permian Basin, what happened in the, in the Dakotas, and what happened with uh, the ability to, to drill and to, to horizontally drill. As I used to always say, that while, while things were going well in the, in the Permian Basin, the, uh, until about 10 or 15 years ago, when we drilled a well, when we stuck a soda straw in the ground, our hit rates were about 50%. Beginning about 10 years ago with, uh, 
uh, seismic uh, uh, technologies that allowed us to look in, in, into the ground far more efficiently than we did for, for the previous several decades, we knew that the, the, the uh, uh, reservoirs that we were finding were not as finite as your fist, but looked like your hand with fingers extended. We didn't have any way, however, to drill into those fingertips. Now with horizontal drilling and with seismic technologies, we knew where those fingertips were. We knew if we sent down a soda straw to, to, to the top of that uh, formation, and we could send not just one drill down, but one drill, two drills, five drills, 10 drills, turn them, extend out into the fingertips. We were finding crude oil in places that were simply not, not available to us for decades prior to. And with seismic technologies, our hit rates were, were in excess of 90%. In the Permian, in the, in the Dakotas, in the Marcellus Shale, we suddenly became the, the leader in the world as far as con production of crude oil is concerned. A decade ago, we were producing about four and a half million barrels of crude oil in the United States. In December, we were producing about 13.1 million barrels of crude oil in the, in, the, in the United States. Suddenly we had become, although we were not exporting crude oil we, because it was illegal to do so, we were, we were exporting products. Uh, we became a net exporter of energy which was an astounding circumstance to say the very least. And suddenly the game changed. Corona, the, the virus came into effect. I always, I, I thought that after nine years of economic upturn that we were probably due for a recession anyway. I was becoming recessionary philosophically in late October, November, and December, and the, crude, and, and the coronavirus simply made it worse. All of a sudden, the world had suddenly, instead of being deficit of crude oil, the world suddenly found itself with, the, with an abundance of 10 million, 20 million, 30 million barrels of crude. Last Monday will probably never be replete, repeated, or let us hope that it shall never be repeated. Who lost in that last Monday when, we, when crude oil went to minus 30, well, it actually traded at minus $40, minus $40, settled at minus $37 for the day. I hope that we shall never see that again, but who got hit in that? China. Bank of China had a, a fund uh, called the Crude Oil Treasure, and uh, they overstayed their welcome. They stayed into the delivery. They had no place to take the crude oil that they were delivered to. The only way they could do it was to pay somebody to take the crude oil away from them. They were hit for, it looks like a billion dollars. God bless them. I, it, it couldn't happen to a nicer crowd of people. That probably shall not happen again. But one of the things I've learned over the course of the last five years is to watch crude oil without getting too esoteric, without getting, going off into the space too, too, too far, watch how the contango, how the front month trades to the second, how the front month trades to the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh contracts. In bull markets, in crude oil, in bull markets and grains, but in crude oil, in bull markets and crude oil, in real protracted, God-loving bull markets, the market goes to a backwardation where the front month trades at a premium to the second, premium to the third, premium to the fourth, premium to the fifth. In good bull markets, on up days, the front months should gain on the back months. In real bull markets, even on down days, the front months should lose less. The backwardation should widen every day in a bull market. And it did for, for several years. Beginning about a year ago, the backwardation ceased to exist. And suddenly we went to what's known as contango. Now don't ask me why they call it backwardation and contango, that's just the terminology. But now everybody is comfortable hearing the term contango. Contango is simply the fact that the front month trades at a discount to the second, trades at a discount to the third, a discount to the fourth, and a discount to the fifth. In great bear markets, the contango always widens. On up days, the front month loses more. On down days, the front month loses a lot more to the second, third, and fourth contract. If you learn anything from me today, learn to watch the, the, how the market changes, how the informed money, as I like to say, wise money, usually hedge money, is leaving its footprints and it leaves its footprints in the shifting nature of the term structure. Beginning about a month and a half ago, the contango was widening every single day. Even on up months, even on up days, the contango widened and that's as it should be. In the last couple of days, we've actually begun to see a little change in that shift in, in the shifting nature of the contango. Keep an eye on it. If after four or five days you've, you've seen the front month gain, it doesn't have to gain dramatically, but gain on the second, third, and fourth, you might want to say to yourself, perhaps the lows are in. I have my doubts. I think that, well, let's put it this way. I don't think we're going to minus 37 again, but do I think we can get down to $5 a barrel again? I fear that we shall, and the contango will tell us that, that it is. Who's, who's turning crude oil production down? 
I think it was uh, Chevron today who said that they were going to reduce their production per, by about 400,000 barrels per, per month beginning in two months. It's not that the United States has any, we can't force our, our companies to do so, but the market is telling them they have no choice. Saudi Arabia and Russia both had a war with one another at an absolutely inopportune time, a war in price at an inopportune time. It could have happened at a worse time, and I don't think that they understood what they were doing when they did it. But I think the winner in this eventually shall be Saudi Arabia. The Russians have a problem because they don't want to shut off production at all. And if you have one person to watch and pay attention to, there's a fellow who runs Rosneft, Russia's largest uh, uh, crude oil producer, Igor Sechin, who happened to be my, uh, Vladimir Putin's superior in the KGB when both of them were in KGB 25 and 30 years ago in St. Petersburg. Igor Sechin thinks he can get crude oil production out of the side, basically out of Siberia, well, east of the Urals, for about five to six dollars a barrel. Whenever there's been discussions, uh, talk about the Russians curtailing oil production, Sechin in the background has refused to do so. Mr. Novak, the, the Russian uh, oil minister, may talk about reducing pr crude oil production, but he takes his orders, for lack of a better term, from, Mr. from, Bo from Igor Sechin, and Sechin has no intention of curtailing production. That's the problem that the crude oil market suffers from right now, is that even, if the, even when the Saudis and the Russians agree to curtail production, Igor Sechin has no intention to do so. The fact that we went to zero, less than zero shouldn't surprise too many people, to be quite honest, because out of the Marcellus shale, it's been common for nat gas produced in the Marcellus, and the Marcellus is that wonderful shale formation that moves basically from West Virginia up to the St. Lawrence Seaway through, through uh, Pennsylvania, on up through New York and to the, same, to the rock formation that, that created the uh, St. Lawrence. And there were times uh, when the Marcellus shale crude oil, or uh, nat gas, sell it, sold it, it actually still sells at negative numbers in many days in the spot market. The futures have not gone to negative in, 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 uh, in nat gas, but the spot market has. And that, the fact that uh, also given the fact that uh, Canadian Western Select crude has at times actually a month and a half ago went to negative, right now trades at about $2 a barrel, tells us that there's still downside for the crude oil market. So if you get bullish on crude, be careful, watch the contango. Let's talk about uh, agriculture if we can for just a second. If there's gonna be a place where inflation, where prices rise, it's gonna be in agriculture. The, uh, the, the, the uh, transportation problems that we have in the United States right now made worse by the, uh, obviously created by the co co coronavirus circumstance, has created a very strange uh, run of, uh, of ill luck for America's farmers, where the uh, packing houses are shutting down one after another after another. Now the president yesterday imposed, a, for lack of a better term, federal law to try to reopen those packing houses. Uh, my, my, if I were a uh, worker at one of those packing firms, my propensity to go into to work, even if the president has told me that I have to, would be greatly reduced. But hopefully, we'll have uh, packing houses will be, be returning to work. The problem is we've produced a large number of cattle, a large number of hogs. We've produced a large amount of milk. We've produced a huge amount of chickens. We're going to produce a large amount of corn. We're going to produce a large wheat crop, which is now the, the winter wheat crop is now stung coming to maturity and soon we'll start be harvesting. We'll probably produce a slightly smaller amount of soybeans this year than in the past, but for America's farmers have, have moved to, to produce a rather large amount of corn for, for production this year. And one of their problems is with crude oil prices where they are, with coal prices where they are, ethanol prices are under pressure and one third of the corn crop goes to, goes to uh, ethanol production. I'd like to try to be bullish of corn, I, for the sake of the American farmer, but there's no reason, no way, no fundamental explanation to account for a, a rise in corn prices. Now I can, I can probably put together a, a, a bullish case for, for winter wheat once we get the harvest out of the way, because we're producing, this is hard to believe, we're gonna have, we have the smallest acreage in 100 years in wheat this year. Last year we had the smallest acreage in 100 years. Two years ago, we had the smallest acreage in 100 years. We now have the smallest acreage again for the third year for 100 years. We're producing very little, uh, at least the amount of acreage, and the propensity to fertilize or, or take care of that winter wheat crop is, has obviously been greatly reduced. So once the harvest is out of the way, which so that starts in late May and ends in middle of early June, May extend to the end of June this year, once that's out of the way, I can put together a, a quiet, sort of quasi-tentative tenuous 
maybe bullish case for wheat. But other than that, it's hard for me to put together a case for, for the grain markets to be, to be, uh, to be bullish. You know, American farmers uh, are, are euthani euthanizing uh, hogs by the hundreds of thousands per day these days because they can't get them slaughtered. The only thing that uh, you can, if you're a farmer, if you're a livestock producer, you might be able to keep a few cattle more on feed, put them on grass rather than on corn. Uh, because you can take a uh, you can take cattle to market for 100 pounds more and it doesn't do any damage, but uh, a 15 pound pig can't do it. A 15 pound greater weight in pigs, you, they won't take them. So they're slaughtering pigs. The American farmer has become fecund. Uh, he's uh, the ability to produce is just extraordinary, and the ability to get it to market has become disastrous. So if there's a place that uh, we're going to get an inflation, we might get it in food prices but we won't get it at the farm level, which is a very strange circumstance. And God bless the American farmer, but he's got a hard time ahead of him. So to summarize, I think the most important thing to remember here is that interest rates are now about to go higher. And again, for, for three decades, we bought stuff from China, we gave them paper in return. Given the, given the geopolitical circumstances that now prevail, given clearly that we're going to import less, less stuff from China, We'll try to produce it here in the United States. Let us hope that we can do that. But what's, what's again, re, re, uh, returning to my normal uh, circumstance, what's, my, what's your propensity, what's anybody's propensity to buy more stuff from China when we can produce it, when we hopefully can produce it here in the United States? We won't, we will not do that. China's in a, going to be in a world of hurt. We will buy best, less stuff from them. They will buy less paper from us. They have been the great buyer of American debt securities for the past 25 years. They have been not just at the margin, but of the margin, and they are gonna cease doing so. I, I can see that being coming a very, a very serious event. Finally, I, I forgot, I wanna talk about the dollar. The dollar reigns supreme. Whether you like it or not, the United States is, is still the reserve currency of the world, and as long as we remain the, the major military power in the world, and we are indeed the major military power in the world, nobody comes close. We have 11 aircraft carriers, and as I like to euphemistically say, the, na the, the nation with the closest number to us is Italy. They have two. And I so certainly do not fear the Italians as far as being a military power is concerned. As long as we continue to remain the military power of the world, we will remain the world's reserve currency. The problem that is incumbent in, in the currency market is that the euro is, I think, shall be under real, real pressure. The dichotomy between the northern uh, fiscally sound uh, countries in Europe and the fiscally unsound, fiscally uh, profligate countries in the south of Europe is, more, is becoming more and more serious with every passing day. Europe has a problem. It needs a grand pan-European debt market, and the Germans, the Luxembourgese, the Finns, the Swedes, the Danes will never admit to that. They will never allow that to occur. So the only thing that can occur is, uh, I, I, I see eventually that the Italians have to leave the uh, European Union, when the Italians leave the European Union, the Greeks will leave the Union. When the Greeks leave the Union, the Spanish and the Portuguese will do the same thing. I think you're gonna see uh, a great good deal of political di uh, dissension that, that expands, gets worse and worse over the course of the next several months. And I think that uh, once uh, the Euro trades under 107, par becomes a very, very logical uh, point of uh, uh, target on the downside. Once we go through par, pick a number after that. So I'm bearish on stocks. I think that one should be, uh, using the rally that we've had over the course of the past uh, several weeks to demonstrably lighten up. I, I really do believe that that's true. Uh, I think that uh, if you don't do that, you're gonna lose a lot of money. And if you do do that, I think you're gonna lose a less, less money. And he or she, as I said to begin with, he or she who loses the least will be the winner in the next several years. Endowments gonna be down 10 and 12 and 15%. Oh, finally, if you have to avoid uh, private equity, uh, it's going to be a long time before private equity is able to uh, reassert itself. It'll probably be three, four, five years before that happens again. The advent of the, the rush by endowments into the private equity market in the past two or three years, to me, was a signal of a market top of severe consequence. So uh, I, I, the private equity markets are going to benefit some people for the next quarter or so when they show their returns because private equity sends its, its returns out with at least a quarter to a half year delay. 
some of them will be sending out plus plus reports for the next uh, two quarters when indeed they are actually uh, the, the bottom is falling out. So be careful out there. He or she who loses the least uh, will uh, will be the beneficiary of uh, lots and and uh, more money to be managed. That's my story, and I'm sticking with it. Uh, as my old friend Paul Tudor Jones said, uh, trading and investing is like falling in love. You put your arms around that person, you hold her tight until she shows you the first sign of disrespect, then you throw her overboard and disavow any association whatsoever. So that's my story. I think I've used up my 20 minutes. And uh, if we have any questions or comments, I'd, be, I'd much rather talk about that. I, I can't, I'm having a little trouble with my voice these days. So I, I, it's far more difficult for me to speak than I have been in the past. But if there's questions, let's try to answer them. Celia? Great, thank you so much, Dennis, for that um, very interesting background. Uh, the first question we have is, if you win this year by losing less, yes. would you invest in China? As you know, China has held up, um, Chinese equities have held up better than other equity markets this year. The currency has remained relatively stable and bonds have um, done quite well too. Do you expect this to continue? No, I don't. Uh, I think the, the, the loser in the next several years is going to be China. The amount of trade that they do with the rest of the world is going to be greatly limited. What's, what's the propensity on the part of a German to import uh, goods and services from China after China has exported the, 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 the virus to them? I think that propensity has been greatly reduced. What's the propensity on the part of a Canadian to import uh, goods and services from China? All markets, all, all prices made at the margin. And when the last 2% of the buyers become sellers, uh, prices go down when the last two percent of sellers become buyers. Prices go up. The propensity on the part of the of everybody at the margin to be to stop being a buyer and to become a seller, I think, has greatly increased. And China, I think, is the is the country that has done itself a tremendous amount of disservice, and I think is going to be alienated. So, would I buy China? Not with your money. Clearly, not with mine. Uh, changing tax. Uh, there's a question here about the NASDAQ. It's been outperforming everything. Um, yes. Do you think that uh, that will continue or will things that have underperformed like small cap or value stocks finally have their day? My oldest rule of trading is to do more of that which has been working and try your damnedest to do less of that which is not. And if you do that in life, it's, it'll, it'll work. If you do that in, in trading and investing, do more of that which is working and less of that which is not. Clearly, NASDAQ has been working, and if there's going to be a winner of any consequence, and by winner, I mean they will lose less, it's going to be high tech. Tech is going to do well. It's hard for me to be a buyer of tech. I, I've always been the, the one to say I want to buy the things that if I drop them on my foot will hurt. Uh, I like railroads and ships and copper and things like that because they make sense to me. So I've had a hard time for myself being a buyer of tech, but everybody else who's bought tech tech has outperformed and tech is likely to continue to outperform. Uh, we were a great example this afternoon of, of, the, of the ubiquity and the, and the benefits of tech by just having this conference on, on a computer. I mean, five years ago, couldn't have been done. And tech is clearly gonna be the great winner. I'm not wise enough to know which tech will be. There's clearly people working out in garages that are gonna, right now that are gonna come up with new uh, technological advances. So will the NASDAQ outperform Small caps, almost certainly it shall. It's been doing so for the past several years. It's going to probably continue to do so. So do more of that which has been working. Try your damnedest to do less of that which is not. It works. What would you look for in order to change your perspective and, and find value or small cap attractive? Change in momentum or other factors? Change in momentum. I'm always a momentum player first, first and last. And right now, the... Small cap and, 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 and uh, value have been undervalued for a long period of time. They look cheap. They're cheap for a reason. Those, when, there's, when they stop being cheap, a year after they stop being cheap, I'll be a buyer of them. And it will take me a year for them to figure out that they've, they've stopped being cheap and have started to get more expensive. Again, I'm a, I'm a believer in momentum. And right now the momentum is on the side of the, uh, of the NASDAQ. So for lack of a better, better uh, argument, I'll continue to say buy NASDAQ and sell the uh, lower quality stuff. That, that, that'll change eventually. All things change, but it'll change after a year. If you missed the bottom of the bull market in 1982, if you missed it by, and, 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 for example, if you were short of bonds in 1982, 
it didn't really hurt you until 1984. If you didn't become bullish of the bond market until two years after the top in bonds, top in interest rates, the low in bonds, if you missed it by two years, you still had 30 years that it was going to work in your favor. So if uh, NASDAQ starts to underperform against uh, uh, small caps and it does so for a year, I bet it has 10 years to go the other way or longer. I'll wait. I'll be patient. Let's talk a little bit about real estate. Do you see a difference in the appeal of different sectors like office versus residential, or is it just location, location, location? Well, it's not just location, location, location. I think housing is probably, individual housing is probably going to do far better than, than, uh, um, than um, buildings in New York, buildings in Chicago. Uh, the shopping centers are probably, you're probably going to want to avoid them as long as you can, but the housing market is seriously under, millennials seriously underrepresented in, in housing, and eventually they shall have to come to be buyers of houses. Uh, hopefully there'll be somebody to buy my house when I get ready to pass it. Uh, but uh, the problem that the housing market has, as we all know, is the amount of money that, that uh, has the amount of debt that the millennials are carrying. And the problem is it's going to get worse in the next year with unemployment rates as high as they are and likely to get much higher. But five years from now, these things that we're going through right now will have passed. Millennials will be uh, getting married. Millennials will be having children and housing will be a better place to be. So as I said, I'd like to sell New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, LA. I'd like to buy Omaha, Birmingham, Raleigh, Suffolk, Virginia. Um, and I, if I had to make a bet, if I could put on an arbitrage trade, I'd buy housing manufacturers and sell high tech or high level uh, uh, high tower builders. I think tower builders are gonna be in a world of hurt. How would you like to own a 50 story tower in New York City right now that probably only had 60% occupancy to begin with and is clearly gonna to go to 20% occupancy in the not too distant future? How would you like to own that building right now? You wouldn't want to. You don't wanna own it for the next several years. Yeah, um, I guess there it might depend on the on the price, but cell towers sound better than <laughs> than office building towers right now. So cell towers sound a whole lot better than office building towers, no question. So let's um, go back to you. You spent some time talking about uh, commodities, and there are a number of questions that we received about um, various yes, various yes. aspects of that. So uh, basic materials like copper. Um, what what are your perspectives there? Well, Dr. Copper has always been one of the best uh, indicators. Uh, people have used, given it a, a PhD in, in economics. I've, I've given Copper a, a nice master's degree from a second tier school uh, as far as economics is concerned. But you, give me Copper, give me tin, give me aluminum and put them all together and tell me what's going on. And right now they're all in bear markets and that's the, that makes it difficult to be bullish of the economy. Uh, do I want to be a buyer of Copper? Two years from now, I'll probably be a buyer of copper. Do I want to own copper right now? Do I want to own tin? Do, tin? Do I want to own aluminum? Not really. The only thing that I can get, as I said, that I can possibly get interested in in, in, in the commodity markets um, on balance is going to be wheat after we get through the, the harvest this year. I can't be bullish on corn. I won't be bullish on soybeans. The term structures are not telling me to do so. And eventually, once we... Livestock will be interesting because we're liquidating the herds rather, especially the hog market. We're, we're liquidating herds dramatically. We will be short of, of hogs in about another four or five months. We'll be short of chickens. So we're gonna be short of meat. Uh, there'll be a reason to be a buyer of hog futures. But right now, even that is gonna, it's on the sidelines. The only thing that, that interests me at, the, at this point is, is wheat. And, and it's still a month and a half or two months away. Well, how about precious metals like gold, especially since you, uh, you think rates are going to um, go up and there'll be inflation? Well, I've been bullish of gold for several years, uh, and I've been bullish of gold in, in, in a strange manner. I've been bullish of gold in, in non-U.S. dollar terms because I think the dollar is going to remain re reign supreme, is going to go demonstrably higher. And I'd rather own, I've, I, until today, and this is quite interesting, until today, I wanted to own gold in euro terms. Today, the market it appears to me to have turned for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, gold gave up a percent and a half, which in gold is quite a bit, and the euro actually rallied. So I shed my position today for the first time in almost a year and a half. Now that doesn't mean I won't come back and buy it, 
but uh, there's a, the, the problem with the gold market was that the bullish consensus had gotten to be almost 80%. And anytime you get 80% of people on one side of a market, it's starting to get a little, uh, the, the, the boat's getting a little laden on one side and can tip over pretty easily. So for the first time in a long time, I don't have any gold on, which is unusual for me. Uh, there's one more question here on this thread of um, various commodities, and that's about, um, about the metals and specialty metals like rare earths. Is that something that you'd be interested Beyond, in, especially as it relates to the whole re renewable, um, uh, renewable energy theme? Beyond, beyond my ken, to be quite honest. I mean, it's, it's an area that I have absolutely no expertise in whatsoever. I show my, my lack of expertise in enough areas. Uh, I, I don't need to really show a, 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 an egregious lack of expertise in an area of rare, rare, rare minerals. So I'll let other people who are wiser than I, far, more, far luckier than I, and far more speculative than I trade in that area. Now, still sticking with commodities a bit, but moving to midstream, there's a question here about um, income products such as MLPs um, as well as BDCs. Or do you have any, um, do you find them to have any appeal? MLPs interested me. Uh, that was my, one of my largest positions in my own account in uh, September, October, November, and December of last year. And uh, the, the manner in which they broke, it was, it was so pleasant to get paid monthly, uh, monthly dividends in some instances. Those monthly dividends add up very quickly. Uh, but 16 cents or 17 cents a month on a 12 or 13 dollar MLP or a, or a closed end fund or, or an ETF suddenly becomes uh, rather inconsequential when the market turns as it did and everything went south. Now, some of these things, just a couple of them off the top of my head, I don't want to give specific names, but there were several of them that were trading at 12 and 13 and 14 dollars and yielding 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 percent that are now trading at 2 and 3 dollars. Thank goodness I got stopped out at 11 and a quarter. I'm interested, I'm tentatively interested in owning them again, but uh, am I rushing out to buy them? Not particularly, and if I do, I'll hedge them in some manner. Now, there's a follow-up, a couple of follow-up questions on your comments on private equity. Uh, <laughs> this, one, this one is regarding private equity. Do you believe there's a paradigm shift in private markets versus public market returns? In past market downturns, returns have not fallen in private markets as much as public markets, but obviously not snapped back as dramatically as public markets either. However, we all know that private equity has outperformed public equity over the long term. So do you think that that will continue or do you see a paradigm change? I think there were too many people get crowding into too, uh, too small a market. Uh, every endowment that you talked to last year was getting into private equity. Now, now, maybe it's going to continue, I mean, and I will grant that possibility. But the fact that it became as crowded as it was, the fact that there was so much money chasing so few products as it was in the last September, October, November, bothered me greatly. And that's, I, could be, I can be totally wrong about this. Maybe it's just a, a, a one-off three-month decline in value, and maybe private equity is going to all new highs. I have my doubts. I just think that... Uh, I've seen too many markets that became too crowded and in, and in the same manner that private equity became egregiously crowded. As I said, every, every endowment, every pension fund in the world was trying to buy its way into private equity. I just would prefer staying away from it if, if I had my druthers. So at the university where, at the one school where I'm the chairman of the, of the endowment, I um, have laid down the law that I don't want to buy any more private equity. My board of directors tells me that we need to buy more private equity. So we reached a loggerhead. So uh, we're not buying much private equity right now. I think, we're doing, I think that's the right thing to do. It just became way, way too crowded. And um, every, 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 like I said, every endowment, every uh, pension fund, and every MBA graduate student was going off into private equity. That just marked, to me, that it had the hallmarks of a major multi-decade top. Can I be wrong? Oh, you betcha I can be wrong. Do I think I'm wrong? For right now, no, I'm not. We have time for one more question and thought I'd, I'd um, end it with a um, political question. Okay. So 
an election year. Um, the party in power typically um, does everything in their power to keep the economy humming, um, which we're surely seeing right now uh, to, yeah. to enhance election chances. Um, what are your thoughts about the election year impact on the economy? And do you think that um, the incumbent uh, in the US election can win um, if, if the recession persists? If you would asked that question two months ago, three months ago, there was no question that Mr. Trump was gonna win the election. And there was even no question that the Republicans would probably gain a seat or two in the Senate and probably 10 or 15 seats in the House. Uh, that was a foregone conclusion. I don't believe the polls that show Mr. Biden with a four or five percentage point lead over Mr. Trump at this point, because we have to remember at the same point back uh, four years ago, Mrs. Clinton had a seven or eight percentage point lead, and we know how that came out. Do I think that the, the presidential election is closer than people thought though? Yeah, no question. Do I hope, as I said earlier when I started the conversation, I'll vote for Mr. Trump, but I'll do so with my nose held. I, I, I find many of his policies onerous. I find his actions and his manner of being uh, utterly unpresidential. Uh, but is he better than Mr. Biden? Mr. Biden is moving so far to the left, so quickly to the left, it bothers me greatly. Now, if this recession continues, as I think that it shall, what do I, the real problem will be that I think the Senate could go to the Democrats. Uh, they only have to win four seats uh, to, to gain a majority. And I think that there's a very distinct possibility that they will gain four seats in, 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 in the Senate. I think the House will continue to remain with the Republicans. So the, the interesting thing is we'll have ultimate gridlock, a Democratic Senate, a Republican House, and a, and a politically damaged president at the same time. Normally, I applaud gridlock. Normally, I love gridlock because gridlock, you can't do anything to hurt me. But in this circumstance that prevails right now, we probably would do better with, if we had a, a, a president in the House and the Senate all of the same party. Uh, we'll see if that happens. But I have my doubts and I'm, I'm fearful that Mr. Biden could actually win the election. I, I hope that he doesn't because he's so far left and he's moving farther left by the day. In fact, I think there's a real distinct possibility that he may not even be the nominee. Well, Dennis, thank you so much for your perspectives. And in the interest of time, um, we're gonna have to draw this to a close. I'm gonna turn it to Andrea to, to uh, wrap us up. Thank you so much, Celia. Thank you, Dennis. And if you could uh, feel what I feel, it's everybody clapping in the audience. If we were in person, that's what they'd be doing right now. <laughs> and uh, really, really, they would be. Um, and I, I just want to say thank you, um, Donna and I. We're hoping that maybe, Dennis, you'll come back for part two because there's 28 more questions that we just didn't get to yet. So hopefully, uh, in, in TII fashion, we really like to keep things on time. And um, well, if, you, if you want to scrape the bottom of the barrel again, I'll be. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, thank you so much um, for being here with us. And um, what I wanted to really say to all of our members out there and our sponsors, you know who you are and um, supporting us the way you have through the years and, and, and all, the, all the love and outpouring of support that we're getting in emails since COVID-19 has hit. Um, it's, it's been incredible. And, and as you know, we're a small business and we thank you. We thank you for your support. We thank you for continuing to uh, to come to our meetings, hopefully when we're able to be in person again. And uh, we're not going to get together in person until we feel it's safe as an environment for all of us to be together. And what these are meetings that we're doing right now um, are just ways that we can stay connected um, with one another. So that said, I do want to say that um, if you look at the slide that came up that we're sharing, uh, we will have our next TII virtual coffee break series session two and three. Um, those are the dates, May 14th and May 28th, 2 p.m. This way you could put it on your calendar now, and that will be open to the larger community. So we hope that um, you will be able to come and we'll let you know who those uh, speakers will be. Um, but something really exciting that Donna and I thought about recently after talking to many of our members is we are launching the TII Asset Owners Virtual Meetup Series. And just quickly what that means is it's for asset owners. You must be a CIO or a senior level investment director, senior associate um, from an endowment foundation, hospital, pension, or single family office. And we're gonna offer those twice and we're gonna have you write the program. And there, these will be one and a half hour series. Um, we'll offer it two times each Tuesday and it'll be by, by, um, bi-weekly. So um, we'll send you more information on that, but we'll only be able to take 10 
per session. It won't be a webinar. It'll be a Zoom meetup. So you'll be able to see the 10 of you on screen and you'll be able to talk about the two most important in an hour and a half uh, issues that you're having um, at your university or your pension or your family. So we'll, we'll explain more about, more about that, but um, we just wanted to say thank you, thank you from the bottom of our hearts for doing this, for being part of our, our, um, our company, for being the community that you are. We're so grateful. And, and Dennis and Celia, uh, thank you for being our guinea pigs, I guess we could say, for doing a virtual meeting. Um, if any of you have any questions for us or you just wanna say hello, uh, please just give Donna, myself, both of us a call anytime. Thank you so much for being with us today. Take care, be healthy, stay safe.